Okay, well, good morning, everyone. We want to welcome everyone today to our last, but certainly not least, back to school lecture series presentation. We are so proud and thankful to have a legal team with us today from Littman and Crooks LLP to shed some light on what parents really need to know in terms of the rights of a special education student and their families and how those rights must be upheld in accordance with education law. With us today is Nicole Garcia, a paralegal and special education case manager who has been with Littman Crooks for more than 23 years. Nicole Garcia received her bachelor's of science in legal studies at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and received her master's of education from Mercy College with a specialization in special education from birth to sixth grade. Nicole's a member of NAPSEA and is also DASA certified. We are also so excited to have Marion Walsh with us today. Marion is an experienced attorney who leads Littman and Crook's growing and very vibrant special education practice in Rybrook, New York. Marion received her law degree from NYU School of Law and has been working in the fields of education law for over 25 years. Um, no. Marion serves as an impartial hearing officer for children with disabilities and is a very strong and passionate advocate for students in many capacities. Okay, so remember parents and professionals, this is your opportunity to get any questions you may have pertaining to education law answered. I will be monitoring the chat room for questions, so please do not be shy. So without further ado, we welcome paralegal and special education case manager, Nicole Garcia. Thank you, Candace, and thank you for inviting me to speak at this series. I also would like to thank both organizations for allowing myself and Marion to be a part of this discussion. And we hope to enlighten parents on their rights um, and what they can and cannot do when it comes to um, advocating for their children. Thank so you. I'm going to go ahead and start the discussion. And we're going to start with special education. Advocacy is important. Districts and parents have differing views and goals. So when I speak with parents, when they first contact my office and I start working with them, um, I let them know that they're their child's most important advocate. While we will do our job and advocate zealously for the children, it is the parent who also has to advocate. So, and I also let them know that they need to speak up about their concerns about their child's education, whether it be in the classroom or at home, because they both work together. It's not just, just in the classroom and it's not just at home. Next slide. And Marion, if you want to chime in as well, you're muted though. Oh, it's fine. Thank you, Nicole. I, um, I agree with you 100%. And um, it's important to advocate because remember the district we're going to talk about, Nicole is going to talk about this, but the district is going to have a very different lens on how they see your child and may do the minimum, which doesn't mean necessarily from their perspective, it's not enough. They just may claim it's least restrictive or the child needs independence. Um, so, so you just, and you need to advocate when you think something's wrong, when you think your child's not making progress, when there's the wrong placement. Bullying. There are infinite number of situations, but I'll turn it back to Nicole now. Okay. So next slide we have is what are the barriers to cooperate to a cooperative relationship? Parents and districts not understanding their legal obligations, a different lens. The parent may have one view while the teacher's administration may have another view of the child. Failure to understand com the complex child. There's not just one vision of a child. There's many different facets that goes into a child and the way they learn and how they learn and you know the process of their learning. So that may be, there may be different views on that as well. Limited resources. We know districts tend to cut every year the resources that are available to children. So this may impact your child. And you know, while we understand that their reasonings for cuts is to limit the 
you know, ending of teachers and services in the building, we still need those resources for the children. Turf wars, that means the school thinks or the district thinks that their, like, their way is the best way, but the parent is like, no, it's not working for my child. Coming to the table with a pre preconceived or a predetermined program or services. Before you get to the IEP meeting, they have already decided that they're going to cut services for your child, that they're also going to, you know, stop, discontinue services, or may even just discontinue the IEP altogether. And in possible disagreements, you and the, the district and the parents do not disagree, I mean, do not agree on any aspect of the child's education. Next slide. Um, okay, so how do you build a more cooperative relationship? Understand that there's a mutual goal, the appropriate education of the student. So I always tell parents this as well. While you may hate your child's teacher, you may hate the administration, you may hate the whole, everybody in the building. The purpose of the meetings with the children for the child is for the child and the appropriate education of the child. And again, just going back to what the words that I'm using, the district does not have to give your child the best education. They need to give the appropriate education for your child. So always remember that when you go and present yourself to your district as well. Shared responsibility in the education of the student, good communication and understanding. This is key. If you feel that your child's teacher is not communicating the problems that's going on in the classroom, as well as anything related to your child, you need to speak up and say, can you please give me notes? Can you please send me emails? Can you please give me calls? Whatever works for you so that you know what's going on with your child's education. Parents should have a record of, a record of documenting concerns respectively. Write everything down. Please, 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 if you don't remember anything from this series today, please remember to write every concern you have down. Understand respective legal rights and obligations. And that's why we're having this series so you understand your rights. Okay. And then the last one, showing co cooperation is essential to any due process complaint. Another thing, if you don't take away anything, please take away that you need to cooperate with the district, whether you want to or not. Tips for strong and informed advocacy. Understanding laws that applies in terms. Now, this is piggying back to what I just said. The district does not have to give the best. They need to give what's appropriate. Knowing your child and trust your instincts. What is working? What is not working? Understanding school district's obligations. What the district is responsible for. Be persistent, patient, and professional. I say this because when people file for complaints and even when they're having issues, they think that everything's supposed to get solved overnight. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. It's a process. That's why it's called due process. It's a process. It could be long. It could be tedious. But when you're doing this, you need to pack your patients and use them because that's the only way you will get through the process. Again, write down concerns, document. If you're filing something with the district, take it there personally, have it time stamped, have it date stamped. That way you can go back and say, when, especially if you have to file a complaint, you have it in writing that I took my note on June 30th at 939 AM and I have the stamped copy with me. Exactly, Nicole, so thank you. That's so important. Um, so I'm going to jump to the next slide and just talk about some of the, um, the laws that protect your child and give you rights as well. Um, 
So the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or Education Improvement Act uh, first passed in 1975 and last reauthorized in 2004 is the main statute or law that does protect students with disabilities and requires every school district in the country to identify, evaluate, and locate students who may have disabilities. And once they've identified and classified these students, provide a free appropriate public education, which we'll talk about a little bit later. You can see those words appropriate are general, but they mean and mean different things to different parent, different parents and districts, but it's very important to uh, be able to advocate for what's appropriate for your child. Um, and then there's section four of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And that was the first disabilities anti-discrimination law passed in the country and really protects individuals from discrimination and can also protect students additionally and will be, a student is protected by 504 if they have, are covered also by IDA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. I just wanna talk about the Dignity for All Students Act, which is not a law specifically for students with disabilities. It applies to every student in New York State. And it's a law that requires districts to ensure that the environment is free of bullying. And we know that that's almost a task that they can never do, but it's very important because um, students with disabilities are more susceptible to bullying than other students. And it can be really have devastating consequences. Um, so just to talk a little bit more about the IDA, again, this federal law ensures students have the FAPE, we're calling you, we'll use the term FAPE for your appropriate public education. And an IDA is different than 504 because IDA re emphasizes special education and related services and a program. Um, and it's designed to meet, meet a student's unique needs and also eventually prepare them for further education, employment and independent living. So there is a, this is a mandate from the school district that they have to do this. Um, and five, 504 is also a mandate, but it's a little bit, um, it's more of an access law. Which, so um, in addition to the IDA, New York State and every state in the country has their own statutes and their own regulations, and they can provide additional rights to the IDA, but they cannot provide less. So New York State actually gives parents more rights in some in most situations, many situations than IDA. For example, federal law doesn't require um, five days notice before a committee on special education meeting, whereas um, the New York New York State law does require those five days. Um, and just a little bit about 504, it protects individuals from discrimination, and it's a much broader statute. It covers a broader range of students. It's going to entitle children with disabilities or adults, young adults with disabilities to have, a, to be eligible if they have a disability that limits a major life activity, substantially limits a major life activity. And it doesn't have to be learning, it could be breathing, it could be thinking, it could be walking. Um, and then they have to have a FAPE under 504 designed to meet their individual education needs. And it's more of an access law. You're in some situations you'll get services under 504, but um, in some cases, it's just going to be accommodations. And then also just to mention the Air Americans Disabilities Act also does offer some specific rights regarding communication and, and access as well. And it's very aligned to 504, okay? Um, just a little bit more about bullying because we see a lot of these cases. Um, students with disabilities are very vulnerable to harassment and bullying. And um, we've seen some really tragic cases where it can even lead to situations as extreme as a student um, becoming suicidal. And we've even seen student suicides, for example, in Peekskill, there was a recent case of a 10 year old student who took his life um, due to allegedly reports of bullying. Um, so, and the districts are going to, or do have a mandate to keep students safe and to supervise students, but you're gonna, as a parent, you're gonna have to be an advocate on bullying. And even if your child says, don't, don't tell anybody about this, um, or you notice changes in your child, you notice they don't wanna to go to school, you notice bruises, you notice they're afraid, you notice they have sleepless nights and you wanna figure out what's happening and work with the school because don't just ignore it and don't just think it will get better. It doesn't always get better and you have to be that advocate. And again, back to McCole said, document, document, document. My child was hurt today in school. He said, um, Aiden, the student pushed him and please let me, please investigate. And you can, you do have to, um, you can ask for a DASA investigation and that every school does have to have a DASA coordinator. 
Um, so just keep that in mind. Okay. And, and then I'm going to turn it over to Cole. Nicole for the talking about how to go about the classification process if your child is not classified with a distance to um, have an IEP. Okay. So this section is about the classification for special education. So as you can see, we listed the different disabilities a child can have in order to be classified. In New York State, there's been 13 disability classifications defined by the New York State Department of Education. So during the meeting, they will talk about classification, like your initial meeting, they'll discuss classification. And then it will be one of those 13 defined categories that they will use to classify your child. Okay. And then the second thing we talk about is who by reason of disabilities needs special education and related services. Educational impact of an individual needs to drive services, not diagnoses, not classification category. Next slide, Mary. Okay, and then as I was just discussing, when you have your meeting, or which I said the IEP meeting, individualized education program. This is a written statement for a child with a disability that describes special education programming and related services designed to meet the unique needs of the child. I call this the contract between the parent, the school, and the student. The IEP must include a statement of the child's presence levels of academic achievement and functional progress, measurable goals, annual goals that are designed to enable the child to make progress in general education curriculum, a description about how the child's progress will be measured, as well as measurable post-secondary goals for children age 15 and over. And I'm sure if you joined the other series, you heard them speak about the IEP as well. Marianne, I'm gonna turn it back over to you now. You're muted. You're mute. Yep, got it. Okay. Yeah, so um, sometimes I just wanna talk about that classification progress for um, parents of students whose children are not classified. Because um, remember, Districts have an affirmative obligation to identify students whom they may suspect have has a disability. It's called what's called the child find obligation and extends to children who are suspected of being a child with a disability and in need of special education, even though they know are advancing grade to grade. And this can be an area of contention in many of our cases, because, um, for example, we work with many uh, twice exceptional children, which means a student may have high cognitive disabilities, but may have an emotional disability, may have depression, may have anxiety, may have other uh, mental health issues, or may have severe say, ADHD. But somehow, even though the student has this disability that the parent sees this great impact, the student may still be getting good grades. For example, we've worked with students who, um, even though they've missed say 100 days in the school year, still manage to pass their classes. And they may have se severe school anxiety, but somehow either get home instruction or manage to somehow just do well on the assessments and the district gives them accommodations. And that is not an appropriate education if a child is not attending school. And the Southern District of New York has stated that. So we often have some, um, some discussions about what the parents will claim, my child needs an IEP and often, in students with severe, with emotional disabilities, the student may one semester be getting straight A's and then the next semester not be able to go to school at all and maybe say cutting themselves. We, you know, I do a lot of work with met students with mental health conditions. And sometimes the district doesn't act fast enough to identify that student. Or maybe, you know, maybe the parents are in denial, don't know what's happening. Maybe the district is claiming it's all the parents' fault. There's a lot of blame that goes on. So it's important to understand that even if it's not a cognitive disability, the district has an obligation to identify, evaluate, and you know, possibly classify the student you know, if, if they see the educational impact. So identify, evaluate, and educate students. So that's very important to, to understand. Um, okay. Oops, let me just go to the next slide. Oops. Okay. Um, Nicole, do you want to go back to the FAPE? The free? Sure. Yeah. So as we dis, um, discussed before, we were talking about FAPE, which is free appropriate public education. 
And once the child is classified, the district must provide your child with the FAPE. And what is FAPE? It's special education and related services that are provided in an IEP designed to meet the unique needs of the child with a disability, reasonably calculated for educational benefit, appropriately ambitious in accordance with the student's needs and circumstances, meet state standards, and are provided at public expense. So when we say at public expense, it means the district that they are required to do this and you should not have to come out of pocket for your child to receive a FAPE. Okay, and then now we're moving into the CSC meeting and the important documents used to create the IEP. So in order for an IEP to be created, we should have evaluations. This should drive everything that goes into the IEP, everything surrounding the IEP, as well as the present levels, the goals, which as parents, you have a right to have input on and say, if you think that they're attainable, not attainable is too high, you should change some wording to make it measurable, so on and so forth. And then the creation of the program services and accommodations that the student will receive. You're muted, Marion. I think Sorry about that. Me. There we go. Okay. Um, so um, if there's any questions up to this point, let us know because we do want to make it collaborative. Candace, are there any questions or do you have any questions or? So far, no, not at this time. Okay. Um, so in this, <laughs> great information. In this, yeah, in this process that Nicola just talked about from the evaluations to eligibility, to present levels of performance, to goals, to program services and accommodations, there are likely or could be disputes or disagreements or just I'm not seeing things the same way. So the first thing is before the evaluation to understand what the district has to do and how you can be part of this process. Because likely if you're, the, the district will just send you a consent for evaluation um, it might just say um, educational testing, or it may actually list the testing. So you wanna make sure that the district does do psychoeducational testing. And we always ask that that include social emotional testing as well. And then, and also some, um, some testing on executive functioning. So, so you don't just wanna have a, a psychoeducational that just does cognitive testing because the student is, is more than just their cognitive levels. There is gonna be a classroom observation if the student is say on home instruction, then the district should do the home instruction, the observation at home, but sometimes they will wait to the students in the school environment. There will be a social history that the parent will write up and you can have, you will certainly have input into that. If it's an interview and a district psychologist writes it up, just make sure you see it before it goes in and becomes part of this child's record. And sometimes we see with parents, this process is difficult. And sometimes if, especially as if a parent is having a difficult time with the district, you may just want to ignore these papers when they come in and just not read them or put them aside, put them in the mail, they get piled in a pile of mail, you may not read them. Read them when they come in as hard as it is. Because if that document says something incorrect about your child, it's part of their record and it's gonna be hard to correct it later. So that's part of the documentation is also correcting what is incorrect about the districts. And if you, you know, the same with an IEP, when you read it, you read that the comments are wrong, tell the district, just document it. They may not change it, but you have at least a documentation of what your position is. Um, there also has to be a physical exam that could, that's likely gonna be from the child's pediatrician. Um, and if you, but you can also um, ask the district physician to do that, but usually it's gonna be your own. Um, so you can request um, specific tests and areas of need, such as speech language, and the district is obligated to do those if they see the area of need, but they may not always see it. Executive functioning, occupational therapy, um, physical therapy, and other testing as well. And there are also, remember, there are specific supplemental subtests within tests, because sometimes the district might just do a few subtests of a um, psychoeducational, and you really want to have um, a pretty comprehensive look for your child. Okay. Excuse me, Marion, I do have a question. Is there a specific um, 
amount of time, like a grace period that districts have once a parent does request a specific evaluation. Um, I just want to clarify, confirm um, what, how much time um, should the family e expect to wait, like by law, is there a specific time? Well, when the district does the initial eligibility, mm -hmm. they have um, 60 days or 60 school days, depending on whether it's till the IEP meeting or until they finish the evaluation. So there is a specific timeline from when there is, and it goes from when the, the parent signs consent for evaluations, not from when you refer the child. Gotcha. So, um, so that's part of what Nicole talked about cooperation. If you don't sign that consent for evaluations for the district to do the evaluations, um, they don't, that their timeline does not start for the initial. Now, if you write a note to the district to say, I request a speech language evaluation, there is not unfortunately a specific timeline on that. Um, however, you can, if the district just delays and doesn't do it and your child is not making progress, you can use that in a, a complaint or to say the district did not adhere to my request, you know, and my child needed this evaluation and clearly, and, um, or the district didn't evaluate in the three years that they're required to. So you can use that in a complaint, but it's there's not a timeline in the regulations specifically. So that's important, I think, to emphasize for our families that the time starts ticking um, from the point at which the consent to evaluate, evaluate is signed. Yes, exactly, and given to the district. The, okay, and, perfect. And we don't, you know, sometimes districts will delay when you write that note um, requesting, you referring your child or for the, referring your child for special education, they may delay it for a month and not give you their consent. And that's not right either, but that, that's not covered in the regulations, but you should, if you don't get that consent within say a week, you should just keep reminding them, hey, hey, I requested to have evaluations and I consent, please. But you do have to sign there. They're gonna want you to sign their form. Yeah. In your experience, yeah. is, it, is it best when parents to, to make the process more efficient, uh, deliver that, that signed consent form to the district? Hand delivered um, with the timestamp versus that's often the best. You can you can right. email it. You can email it. Um, you'll have a record if you email it too, but it doesn't hurt to go in and bring a timestamp either way. Especially in COVID times, people were not going in yes. bringing things in, but it's fine to do it via email as long as you just keep reminding them. You know if they miss it, because right. districts do get a lot of emails. So um, some districts have different procedures too, and some you know, but um, but we just want to make sure you get it to them. You can mail it also, but um, just can do it all three ways. <laughs> yes, right. yeah. um, okay. But it is important to note that just that from when you sign that consent, it only has to be one parent too. No, it doesn't have to be both parents. Okay. All right. So let me just, um, so, um, so it's just important to advocate before the evaluations are even done. And then, um, and then just you, as, as Nicole noted, you know your child best. So you want to know what testing they're going to use. If your child um, is not, is nonverbal, you want to make sure they don't just give your child a standard IQ test. There are specific tests and specific modified tests that districts can use to try to ascertain what your child's strengths are. And even if they can't communicate in an IQ test, they can give you a sense of what they're thinking, what they know. And that's important because that IQ test, unfortunately, can still be determinative. It shouldn't be. We all know it's only one measure of a student's functioning, but districts often use that in many decisions. Um, you may want to um, actually ask for a certain diagnostic test for autism because um, just doing an evaluation, a district is not going to have a sense of whether a student has autism. They may. I mean, some, some students present with autism very early, but we see some students not identified till high school or even later, which is unusual. You know, sometimes very high function students with high functioning autism. So there is the um, ADOS, that's the Autism Diagnostic Observational Schedule, I think, or that's, I think that's acronym or the, um, or the, um, the CAP testing, which is, which are rating scales for autism. Autism is um, a spectrum as we know. So um, it's not going to be based on one test. It's going to be based on rating scales and where a student falls on that category, but you may want to, you can ask the district to do that and they have to have someone certified to do that. Um, you may want to ask for some visual motor integration testing, some motor free visual perception, Testing, you may wanna ask for some specific speech language testing, such as on pragmatic language, not just a basic um, receptive or expressive language, but how does the student actually understand language? Um, reading test, the uh, gray or reading test, the GORT, the WIST, um, 
I mentioned the social emotional testing, that's the behavioral or adaptive rating scales, you know, because sometimes, for example, students who, um, who internalize social emotional issues may not present with anything at school because they're so concerned about just presenting well in school and are not going to say I'm upset or just going to keep it on side. But if you do those rating scales, they, it may come out that the student is depressed or is having all these um, internal um, dilemmas. And those are some of the students most at risk, the ones who internalize. Um, you can ask for neuropsychological testing to examine specific cognitive functioning and memory functions. And we'll talk a little bit about independent testing. You can also go to an independent person, but the district can hire a neuropsychologist as well to do testing. And for those complex children that Nicole mentioned, sometimes that is needed. Um, okay, so, um, so then, so just um, in this process, um, so you refer your child or, or your doing a reevaluation, the district, you sign the consent, the district does the evaluations. You should expect to get the evaluations before the IEP meeting. Now that's not in the regulations, but it, we think it is part of parental participation. And, it, and, and then you can also ask for them as well. Mm -hmm. If you don't receive them, you can ask for them. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you're at the CSC meeting, you just show up and all of a sudden, the district may not even given you a copy and they're just talking about, oh, this is the, the WISC, the student received, you know, received scores in the low average range, 85th percentile. And then on the subtest of BCI, the student received a you know, percentile. You're just trying to absorb all this and you can't do it at one meeting when you're stressed anyway, because you know this is determinative and you're, you're trying to um, just process a lot. So you really should be able to look at those before. And ideally the district will, um, the school psychologist will meet with the parents before to explain things, go over it. Um, so once you look at those evaluations, if, um, if there's something inaccurate, something that the evaluation said you said you didn't say, something that they may just, just, just show negative comments about your child or just show positive, you wanna make sure that there's um, an accurate representation. There may be an error. So we've seen errors in evaluations where they list the percentiles wrong. Um, there are a number of challenges. There could be a nature of things mischaracterized. So um, first of all, you can write a letter noting the, the blatant errors if there are any. And then you, if you just believe this evaluation is not complete enough, you can disagree in writing with the evaluation. To say, I respectfully disagree with the psychoeducational evaluation. And if you disagree in writing, under the New York State regulations and under IDA, you're entitled to um, an independent educational evaluation. And that is an evaluation that the district will pay for, but that um, will be independent. So it will be from an independent psychologist. And there are often disputes about the cost, you know, because districts tend to think the market rate is much lower than it actually is. For example, they may say that you can, the um, market rate for a independent psychoeducational evaluation is $2,500. That's just one example. And we know and we know from our practice that minimally it's going to be 4,500 to up to 7,000 or more. So there could be a disagreement. And the regulations say that there, if the district doesn't grant this request, they have to file for due process, the district, not you. And they can either grant it. So if it gets to be these disputes, you can say, well, we have to go to due process on this. So. Um, and you may find an evaluator you really like, and they may be, you know, six thousand dollars, and you think the district should pay for, it, and the district is saying, well, I'm going to pay. We'll pay only at most four thousand. So then, who's going to pay that extra two thousand? That may be have to be through a hearing or um, just additional negotiations. Um, and you may want to wait to have the CSE meeting, and you can agree to that until the additional testing is completed. But that's up to you because you don't want to delay that sometimes. Okay. Okay, um, so Nicole, I'm going to let you talk after you get the evaluations about the goals on the IEP, which also drive the program. So we call it SMART goals. So they should be specific to your child, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. And it should be at least one annual goal for each need identified. So if your child is receiving speech, it should be goals for that. If your child is receiving OT, same. Um, also, if your child is struggling in reading and math, there should be goals for those as well. Sometimes we see at the meeting that they discuss the related services, but there's also, you know, your child may be behind, be behind in reading, but there's no goals to help achieve, bring your child on level. So there should definitely be goals in regards to that as well. 
Absolutely. That's, and the goals um, really do drive the program. Um, so the goals are very important. It can be easy sometimes to kind of gloss over them, or sometimes at a meeting, the providers just say very quickly, well, these are my recommended OT goals, the OT, and you may not be able to absorb all that. So you can say, you know, I really need to see these goals before um, they go into the final IEP. So could you please send them to me? It's hard. I need to see them in writing. And that's perfectly fine because it's very hard to absorb all that at the meeting. Um, now, let me just, so that's important because these goals are gonna drive the program, even though they may seem really kind of amorphous to the parent and you can suggest them as Nicole has noted. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about programming because um, there is, there's a mandate in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act on a least restrictive environment. And um, that can mean very different things to parents and districts and can mean very different things in, in different situations. Um, so the law is that to the maximum extent appropriate, children with disabilities should be educated with children who are not disabled to the maximum extent appropriate. So really um, every student should be say starting in general education and then moving into, if needed, a more restrictive environment. And we know that doesn't always happen because um, if a student say has been in the special class, say a six to one to one starting in first grade, it's likely the district is going to continue that placement unless it's really not working. But, and we see a, sometimes very significant debates about um, leash restrictive environment because um, you know, every, every parent wants their child to be with students, other students who are either similar or who are going to um, be models for them, not with students who are going to be lower functioning. Um, and that's, it's a dilemma because um, we don't want to certainly say anything negative about lower functioning students, but if it, but for your, for your particular child, we know the peers have a significant influence. So if your child has some behaviors, you may not want your child in a class where they're very significant student behaviors, but the district may say, well, your child has behaviors as well. This is the appropriate class. Say, well, where are the peer models? Where is the placement with non-disabled peers? And the district may say, well, at lunch, the student can be with non-disabled peers. And you can say, well, that's not enough. You know, my child needs to learn with non-disabled peers as well. And that is a really significant dilemma in New York State because we have probably one of the most um, more segregated as far as on every level, but on um, talking about disabilities right now, um, you know, placement structures, because we have a large continuum. New York State developed a lot of their programs earlier than many states. Um, so they did develop, you know, say special classes um, in many districts, you know, 12, 15 to one, 12 to one, um, eight to one, six to one. And some districts have that full continuum. Or if they don't, they may think the child needs to add a district placement. But really, that's not the intent of the IDA to keep the students in those classes full time. It's the intent, if, as long as the student's not severely behavioral, to let the student be in general education. But that doesn't occur as much. And it can be, as I stated, a real struggle because the district may say, well, we just can't teach the student in this um, general education that's not enough services. We can't push in everything. And that there's some validity to that, we understand. But that is the mandate of the law to the maximum extent appropriate. Um, so remember placement in the special class should only occur when the disability is so severe that the education cannot be achieved in general education classes without the use of supplementary supports. Um, and the special education setting should be as close as possible to the student's local school if they're being moved to another school. And, um, and if the child is being placed at a district, um, there should be a very significant reason that they can't make progress there. We see a lot of disputes on that, both either if the child, yeah, sometimes it goes both ways. Sometimes the parent thinks the child needs an out-of-district placement, and sometimes the, um, the district thinks the child needs an out-of-district placement. So we've seen both sides. Um, and there's always a tension between the access to non-disabled peers and the specialized instruction and support. Any questions on that? Or, no. Right, I Not can this time. No. Okay. So this is so related to the least restrictive environment is the continuum of services. And at each meeting, the district should be revisiting the placement. It should be, again, considering the whole continuum. Um, so the first, first level is general education with supplementary aids and services. And even if a child has um, just needs, say, general education with, say, perhaps counseling, they can still have an IEP if, if their disability is creating 
educational impact. We have some districts who's, who have made the claims, well, the child doesn't need a programmatic special education program, so they don't need an IEP. They just need a 504. And that's just not accurate because the standard is whether the disability impacts the child's education, they need special education services and support, not just instructional program. Um, there can be consultant teacher services in general education, which means that a teacher is pushing in to that classroom, either directly or indirectly, and that's, that's going more restrictive. There can be resource room in addition to the general education classroom. Then, as you know, there are integrated code talk classrooms, which are classrooms of students with disabilities and not with disabilities. They, have, they can only have a maximum of 12 students with disabilities, but can go up, there's not a, lim there's not a number for how many um, non-disabled students can be in that classroom. So it could be that there are 12 students with disabilities and 15 or more students with, without disabilities. So it can be a large class, but there are gonna be two teachers, a special education teacher and a general education teacher. Um, and as noted, there can be a special class and the students do have to have similar management, cognitive and physical needs in those special classes. Um, it can be for part of the day or all the day. Maybe the student just needs a special class for math because they struggle in math. Um, and there can be additional staff, eight to one to two, 12 to one to four. But if you don't think your the placement is working for your child, if you think they need more restrictive or less restrictive, you should be able to advocate for that with the district. And then um, the, the CSC Committee of Special Education can recommend an added district placement. They will have to do a search on that. They can look at other school districts. They can look at um, BOCES or in New York City, a District 75. Um, and they can look at approved non-public schools. There's a list, it's called 800, chapter 853 schools that they can look at. Um, now remember the CSC cannot place in a, um, in a private non-approved school. So if you want to place your child, um, I'm just, just saying that you're, you live in Yonkers, you think that this, this program is not appropriate for your child. He hasn't made progress in four years and you, the district won't even do it at a district placement search, but you don't want them in another public school. You wanna look at say the Manhattan Children's Center, which is just specifically geared toward students with autism. You will have to place your child there and then seek reimbursement or seek payment. The district CSC cannot say, okay, we'll place at Manhattan Children's Center. We don't have anything else. They cannot do that on the IEP. It has to be done through a hearing or through a settlement. Okay, so that's a that's a New York State law, and they it's just how the um the funding is set up. Um, so they can't just say, okay, and even if there used to be that there was a process in an emergency, the CSC can do that. That's not even necessarily true anymore. Um, so so you have to go through um, the process, place your child unilaterally, you know, seek reimbursement, and then the district will acknowledge your child is placed there, but will not be giving you an IEP there. They'll be giving you an IEP in the district, but it won't. It will just say the students is unilaterally is unilaterally placed, and that can be that we a lot. Some of our cases involve that process, and it can be long and complicated, and that's a whole and um, for another seminar <laughs> discussion. But um, but it is important to note that because some parents say, well, why can't they just place? You know, no, they can't. <laughs> um, and now there's um, also home and hospital instruction. If your child say cannot attend school, if it's so behavioral, you're getting calls every day or the student's getting suspended every day that at one point the district or you may agree that home instruction is appropriate until you find another placement. It should not be a long-term solution. Um, so, and the mandate has increased from two hours to three hours a day this year for secondary students and from one hour to two hours a day for elementary students. It's not a lot of time, but at least it's increased. Okay, just quickly on the extended school year, um, some students can receive services in the summer. And the thing is, it's not, the standard is, is whether the student um, has regresses during school breaks. In, so it's in order to present, prevent substantial regression, not regress during the year, not that they didn't make progress, but it's really, districts really intend the ESY program is to be for students with severe disabilities. And if they're gonna look at data, they should be presenting data over say the holiday break, if they noticed the student was performing at this level when they left on um, December 20th, and then when they got back in January, they had already forgotten those skills. So that's just, that's just unfortunately how it's measured. It's not a very broad program. So it is gonna be students with um, management needs that have, are gonna be highly intensive, may have severe multiple disabilities, or who have home hospital instruction, and it could be students in residential programs, 
or who are who need that 12 month service and you can advocate a little bit around that but um, that's generally the standard. All right, so we're going to talk now moving quickly on to um, transition services i'll turn it over to Nicole oh wait i'm sorry I forgot one slide. <laughs> um, actually I forgot two slides <laughs> sorry so um so as you as parents know each age that you advocate for your child is going to bring new challenges and students needs can change so um so just because this district has the students set up a certain way in elementary school that may not be the case for high school so each year you have to examine the IEP and think of what your child's needs are now that one seminal point is um, around grade three, um, because that's when the district starts state testing. And there can be very significant decisions made, which we'll talk about, um, because you sometimes it just gets glossed over by parents because there's a spot on the IEP. It said, how will your child be assessed? Um, state assessments or New York State alternate assessment. And alternate assessment is intended to, um, to provide more flexible testing for students who cannot um, who have severe cognitive disabilities and cannot um, access the state assessment. Um, again, severe cognitive disabilities. But remember, the districts don't always tell you, which is required to, that this does not, if they're on alternate assessment, they're not going to receive a high school diploma unless they go back to state assessment. But, and they may say you can do that, but that is very difficult to do because if you've been getting alternate assessment instruction from third grade to eighth grade, and then all of a sudden you realize your child's not gonna receive a diploma, um, it's gonna be very hard to bridge that gap because the, the curriculum is different and it shouldn't be, but it is. Um, so just uh, keep that in mind. Every student should have high expectations um, that they have to meet. And, um, and to the extent possible, unless your child is say, you know, has such severe disabilities or nonverbal, they just can't access the curriculum at all, consider um, keeping them on state assessments if you can. The standard is not, are the state tests stressful? The standard is not, can the child pass the test? The standard is, does this child have a severe cognitive disability? Um, so then um, remember elementary to secondary, there's a lot of departmentalization and things change, different classes. And then middle school to high school, um, first of all, the social emotional needs can increase, the students' needs may change. And then there's gonna be more, um, what the school offers is gonna have more rigidity this, in high school, especially with the regions. And, um, and not every state um, does have that rule that students on alternate assessment cannot receive a diploma. Um, Connecticut does not have that and for example, New Jersey, but New York has a very strict rule on that. Um, although there are a lot of flexible diploma options. And then just, um, just then as high school to post-secondary and IDA eligibility lasts until the student turns 21 or in some cases 22 um, or, or the graduates from high school with a regular diploma. So if your student graduates at 18, they're not gonna be eligible anymore, even if you think they need more services. So that's a lot um, on just the aging. We'll talk, and Nicole will talk about transition a little bit. Okay, so for the oh, wait, I'm sorry, let me, I, I'm sorry, I forgot that I just, I went over the state assess, Nicole, but I'll just go over it. I think I, I just went over this, but this put the PowerPoint on the state assess. Um, just to remember, I limited, just to talk about students with severe disabilities on the, um, state assessments, limited cognitive abilities, have behavioral physical limitations who require specialized education or social, psychological, medical services. So just to keep that in mind, okay, I'll let you, I'm sorry, Nicole. Just... Okay, so for the sake of time, we're just gonna jump a little ahead. So um, in regards to transition, that it starts at the age of 15, the latest, um, it may be a little bit before that, the child is going to be involved as well by filling out a questionnaire, as does the parent, um, asking about like what they want to do in the future. Um, so the next thing we want to talk about, and uh, I'm sorry I'm kind of rushing, but we're kind of getting pressed for time. Um, we don't want you to be surprised, so you need to plan ahead. So if you don't feel your child is ready to graduate, you need to discuss this with the school prior to the time that the child is about to graduate. Don't go in 12th grade saying Johnny is not ready to graduate and Johnny has fulfilled all the obligations to graduate because the school is going to graduate him. It's just, unfortunately, it's the way it is. You can go to hearing about it, but again, you may run the risk of losing because he has filled all the obligations 
to graduate and that he's been able to assess fate during his whole time in school. Okay. So really quickly, we want to get to what happens if you parents doesn't agree with the district. You don't agree with the IEP. You don't agree with that your child is making progress. You don't feel that the placement is appropriate. What happens next? So you can, what is, what can happen is you will go to impartial hearing. And at this time, it's basically like suing the school district for certain things, not monetary. That's not what it's for. It's to ensure that your child gets compensatory services. Like if they miss their speech, that they get services of speech, OT, PT, um, counseling, anything that you feel your child may have missed that was on the IEP, um, you can go and have a hearing in regards to that, as well as the placement. If you feel the placement is not appropriate, this is the time that you could look for a non-approved public school for your child and put it in part of the complaint. Um, and there are certain stages to the process. The first starts with the impartial hearing, which is the lower level. Then it goes to the state review. If you feel, if you didn't win at the partial hearing level, um, you can appeal it at the state review level. And if that is not one out as well, you can go appeal at federal court. But again, these process are processes and it does take time and it can be costly. So I just want you to know that. You wanna answer? Yeah, say anything exactly. as well? Yeah, exactly. No, that's, and I think, um, remember, if you file for the hearing, we'll talk about, you can resolve it. And often most of the cases do settle. So you don't have to go to hearing if you file the complaint. Um, you could also do a state complaint, but that's not gonna be quite as direct. Um, and you could go, you could ask for mediation, but that's often the districts doesn't, that, that can be just as long of a process. And just to keep in mind, the impartial hearing will, it is, it, that's going to take some time, as Nicole noted, it's a process, and it does tend to be a little more in favor of parents than not, because often impartial hearing officers do understand and may have an individual view in the parent perspective. The state office of state review tends to be more um, oriented a little bit toward the district because it is an agency of New York State Education Department that's been determined not to be a conflict. And they're gonna have more of a template review, not have a full trial, but so sometimes districts will appeal to the state review also, and then either party can appeal to federal or state court. So just to keep that in mind, it can be a very long process. And also just keep that in mind, if you disagree, you don't have to go to due process. It's just the way to get if there's a stalemate. And just one misconception we have parents sometimes not understand is that if you disagree in a meeting, it doesn't mean the district is not gonna implement the IEP. You know, if you say, I disagree with this and I'm not signing off on it, they say, okay, we know your disagreement. This is your child's placement. And if you are so opposed to that, you can't just say, I disagree. You have to actually file for due process. So Nicole, will talk about some of the reasons that come up. But. So a parent may file for due process because they disagree with the school district's actions or inactions, um, placement, evaluations, related services, lack of implementation. They're looking to seek tuition reimbursement because they placed their child unilaterally in a private school or any other disagreement with the IEP. Yep. And there is a deadline for you to do a claim of, for um, due process. The IDEA requires that a party must request a due process hearing within two years of when the party knew or should have known of the alleged violation. So you can't come in year four talking about you want something from 2015. We wouldn't be able to file on your behalf for that. It's out of the scope of time. And just to add in, Nicole, there are a few exceptions, as you know, that if um, if the district made specific representations that prevented right. you from, from filing for hearing, or they didn't give you, um, say the procedural safeguards they had to give you. So we, there are some exceptions, but they can be very hard to prove. So that's just to keep that in mind. And it's from when you knew or should have known that you had to fight, that you had a disagreement. So if you have a disagreement at a meeting, I disagree and you just don't do anything to any, but you say you disagree and you, you know, oppose, you're gonna have two years to 
from then to, to file something. Just keep that in mind. You can't, it's not infinite. Okay. I'll go to the next. One. Okay. So just so you know, if you represent yourself pro se, which is mean you represent yourself and not have an attorney or an advocate do it, um, there are certain things that you should put in there, um, which is the due process complaint. Oh, I think you skipped. Oh, did I? Yeah. Oh, no, I went to deadline and um, yeah, no, I'm, but that's. Oh, well, I have what's must, what must the um, complaint contain. But anyway, so just so you know, your student's name and address, the school's name and address, the description of the problem mm -hmm. related to the proposed or refused district action, including facts relating to the problem, any proposed resolution, if there was one, um, and then the district may move to dismiss for inefficiency of the complaint, like because you don't, into all the information that I'm saying, they may want to dismiss. Um, and then the impartial hearing officer will decide whether it's sufficient, your complaint is sufficient or not. Yeah, yeah exactly. And um, sometimes what you see as insufficiency is not listing the proposed resolution as um, specific. You know, for example, if you're requesting, say, makeup services or compensatory, you can't just say, I want compensatory services. You have to say, I request 200 hours. You know, how many hours? Even though you, it may change, you say, I request at least 200 hours of compensatory services in OT. My child hasn't received services in two years. Or I request a change of placement to a 12 to 1 from a... Um, an ICT class. You know, you want to be as specific as you can on that resolution. That's just one area. And you want to prepare to file too. You want to make sure you get records and you can request that through the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Um, and ensure you have cooperated, as you know. And um, again, just remember money damages are not recoverable. As Nicole said, you, you may have so much emotional stress from this process. Every parent does. And um, to the extent you can't sleep, you can't eat, you can't work, that's not recoverable under IDA. It's not, it's going to be very hard to recover under even a negligent standard, but just don't, you don't want to ask, it's not, you can ask for it, but you're not going to receive, the IDA does not provide, and certainly in New York, under um, for emotional distress, and 504 does not either, because the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court has said no emotional distress damages are available under 504. The only way we to do that, to making the claim, would be through a New York State human rights complaint, just to keep that in mind. Marion, can we quickly jump to what happens on um, like yeah. the resolution and then also what happens um, like yeah it was but yeah it was back yeah let me go back to that yeah okay there we go okay that was slide 30 yeah it was um 36 slide 36 okay. yeah so we are oh, yeah. sort of coming to that point uh, in time we're losing uh, many of our participants were on lunch break so we're just okay. going to try to maybe another five more minutes oh, sure. if possible Thank you yeah. so much. This has been really, really uh, informative and, and, and supportive to our families. Yes. I appreciate and value your time. No, well, thank you. And today. just uh, quickly on the resolution session, um, because we did kind of go through the complaint and what it has to contain and the child's placement on pendency, just to keep that in mind. But the resolution is really important because you can attempt to resolve this complaint. And most complaints resolve at resolution or later in a settlement. So if you ask for those 200 hours of PT, the district may come back and say, well, we can't give 200 hours. We will give you a 75, you know, give so that that's, it's better generally to resolve these because this process can be very long if you can. Um, and then if, but if the resolution is not successful, you can, um, you can then go to hearing. Um, so, um, so there's a little bit more about the hearing here. Um, but preparing what happens, but we can do another, always do another presentation on that. And then the hearing comes Absolutely. along. And then what the decision is, um, but that's, I know there, you wanted to kind of wrap it up, but I think Nicole, you wanted to say just something about the resources or questions. Yes, um, there's always resources available. And again, the information we gave is informational. Um, it is not legal advice to be acted upon. Um, you could always reach out to Candace, um, and if you have questions, she will contact me or I will tell her to give my number Definitely. or whatever. We're always here to help if you have you know, specific issues. But just so you know, you can go online and look at um, New York State government, New York State education.gov, and that will give you information about schools and the it will give you information in regards to the 853 list that Marion mentioned before. It will give you information about like 
school rights and your rights and so on and so forth. You can also contact the Office of Special Education in the New York State Department of Education. There's also, which is a parent-friendly website called rightslaw.com. They are very, very helpful and they don't do just New York State, they do all the states. So just be familiar with that. And then of course, if it gets to the point that you can't handle it yourself, you could always seek legal counsel. Um, hopefully you can resolve it without going down that route, but just in case, you know, you have the right to do so. Mm -hmm. And I do just wanna say one thing really quick. If you tend to bring someone with you to the IEP meeting, you yeah. need to let them know that you are, especially if it's an attorney or advocate, because a lot of districts will tend to have their own attorneys attend the meeting as well. So you don't want it to be postponed because you didn't let them know. Also, you do have a right to read, to um, tape your meetings. You just need to let them know as well. Again, a district will probably say that we're gonna tape as well. We're gonna record as well. That is fine. And especially now that a lot of meetings tend to be via Zoom or Teams, that um, you can get that recording as soon as the meeting is over. So I did wanna let you know that as well. I was gonna say that too, Nicole, so thank you. <laughs> and some parents do record without letting the district know. We don't necessarily recommend that, even right. though the state is a one consent state. So really you can record everything as long as you're consenting, but it's harder to bring that into a hearing because the hearing officer said, why didn't you let the district know? Because um, they could, you know, you're entitled to record IEP meetings. You're not entitled to record, um, say, a classroom conference, but you can still record on your own if you want, but we don't necessarily recommend that unless you think it's necessary. It's up to the parent in that case. And that's New York, not other states. Keeping right. Every state has different rules on that. So we want to thank everyone for attending. I know it's a lot of information and I wish we had more time to tell you more, but we understand everybody has to go back to work. <laughs> directly contact you though, Nicole, as a starting point, is that something that you would advise? Yes. If, if have you have questions, you can contact me. My information is a part of this there we go. slide. Um, yes. You can email me, you can call me. As long as it's general, I will, if it gets into specifics, then because you're calling my firm, I do have to tell you what my firm offers. But as long as it's a general question, I will try my best to answer you and guide you based on my information. On behalf of our families and the Autism Project Floss and Kasuti International Incorporated, we thank you both. Uh, we're just immensely grateful um, that you had time in your day, you, you carved out time in your day to join us. Um, this information is so, so, um, you know, necessary, uh, critical. Parents are oftentimes in the dark, so this kind of definitely sheds some light on what their rights are, what IDA says, um, and so just sort of how to proceed um, if they want to initiate due process and, and reach a resolution with their school district. So again, we thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anna. We really appreciate it and keep up the good work and um, happy Friday, everybody. Yes. Um, you can reach out with any, any last questions from the audience? Or, as a, Anybody have anything quickly you want to chime in at all before we close? If not, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And this Thank recording you. will be, will be posted to our Facebook much. Live. Kasuti International and the Autism Project, they will post the recording of this uh, lecture to their Facebook Live page. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Okay, bye, -bye. Yeah. Me puse porque es importante, Sánchez. Esta gente me está ayudando mucho. Yo pongo una hora de noche para hacer esto. El mundo trabaja. Gracias.